Yep, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, all right, so we missed the pr the problem section in the recording, but that's fine. They can just refer to the handout. But we'll continue from circles. Now we're moving on to circles, right? And we're gonna start off by introducing what is a circle. So as you probably already know, a circle is a set of all points that are a distance to R from a point. In particular, all points are equidistant from that point, call it O and at a distance of R. And we say that we call R the radius of the circle and O with center. So for example, if I'm gonna draw a circle here, which is unfortunately not gonna be great, but whatever. And we say the center is point O, then all of these points that lie on the circle are going to be equidistant from this point O in, their, in the distance of it is a constant r, which you say is the radius. Again, this is where the locus plays in. All connects are loci. All right, properties of circles. Every circle is similar to every other circle. And you know, there's homothy by taking one circle from every other circle. And homothy is a bit advanced for purposes, but just know that. And circles are a subset of ellipses. Again, as you'll see on, ellipses are considered stretched circles. And using that characterization, you can actually figure out a discovery. All right, and the equation of a circle, as you've probably seen in school, is the equation of a circle is x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals to r squared. We say here h comma k is the coordinate for the center of the circle and r is the radius. And then you can in fact prove this equation, but I'll leave that as an exercise. And yeah, again, this is a figure, this is a diagram for you to envision. The, the circle with the center of h comma k it has a radius r, and it will go to a point x comma y. And this x comma y can be substituted for any point on the circle because again it is equidistant from this uh, from the center of the circle with the distance of r, the radius. All right. Now the again this is. A bit structured a bit differently. So we're going to go over, over all the theory and then we're going to go over some example problems at the end. So now we have an ellipse. And for me, an ellipse is defined as uh, the locus of all points P on the plane, such that for two fixed points A and B on the plane. So if you're to take points A and B and fix them on the plane, the distance P times A plus P times B or P times A plus B. Is constant. It's always going to be constant. So ellipses look like stretched circles, as you've seen. And indeed, circles are ellipses. Circles are a subset of ellipses. And they just occur at the case that A equals B, right? So with that being said, it's just P A times 2. And then that's just the diameter, where P A is the radius. Oh, there's a, sure. oh, can I go back one time? Sure. Uh, yeah, so yeah, that's the equation of a circle and an ellipse is the locus of all points P on the plane, such that for two fixed points A and B also on the plane, the distance P times A plus P times B is a constant. And for again, for circles, if A equals B, then it's just a circle. And you can think of ellipses as stretched circles. All right, so some terminology, the major axis is a longer diameter of the ellipse, and the minor axis is the smaller diameter of the ellipse. And the foci, which are pronounced focus, uh, the, the plural of focus. And again, I say them as foci and focus, but there might be some other pronunciation that I don't know. But yeah, are the two points A and B again? You know, we have the we have the focus A for the parabola, but for an ellipse, the foci are the two points A and B. And here's a diagram for you guys to see. So again, you have this ellipse, right? And here, these two points A and B are 
uh, the foci of the synapse. And again, if you were going back to the definition, it allows us the locus fault points P such that, you know, P on the plane, such that P times A plus P times B is constant. And that's what you got, this diagram. All right. So the semi-major axis, oh, and again, I forgot to show. So again, the major axis is this longer diameter. So I would say it's E, F, and the smaller diameter, which is the minor axis, is C, D. All right, the semi-major axis and the semi-minor axis are half of the half major, uh, I'm sorry, half of the major and minor axis respectively. So if you were to cut E, F in half, you would get the semi-major axis. And if you were to cut C, D in half, you would uh, get the semi-minor axis. And now we're going to move on to a few properties. So first off, we have the area of the lens. So let the semi-major axis be equal to small a. And again, for points, we usually capitalize them. But for these variables, we're going to lowercase them most of the time. And let the semi-minor axis be P and B. The area of an ellipse in the theorem states, the area of an ellipse is A times B times pi. Now, uh, the actual proof involves calculus, and we don't want to go that far, at least for our standards. But the formula is quite intuitive. If you think about it from the perspective of the characterization that ellipses are stretch circles. So, and you know, you think that the circumference is simple given that the area is also simple, but it is not that, that simple as you think. Like for example, if for a circle, it's pretty simple. You know, uh, two pi r, where r is the radius, it's just the circumference and then pi r squared is, the area, but that's not the case for an ellipse. Uh, I linked a Wikipedia article here, and I'll send it a link. But yeah, the semi-major axis is half of the major axis, and the semi-minor axis is half of the minor axis. If that, yeah. And again, you can check that on your own time. It's a bit com complicated, and so don't worry if you don't understand it. But yeah, all right. Uh, this is a uh, sometimes useful definition uh, for, I'm not really actually sure how I'm supposed to pronounce this, eccentricity, I'm pretty, I'll uh, say it like that, eccentricity. The eccentricity, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the eccentricity of an ellipse is C of A, and ellipse is C over A, where 2C is the distance between the foci of the ellipse. It measures how elongated the conic is. And so suppose E be the eccentricity. We have a circle if E equals zero. We have a parabola if E is greater than zero but less than one. We have a parabola, oh, sorry. We have an ellipse if E is greater than zero but less than one. We have a parabola if E equals one. We have a hyperbola, which I'll get in this next session, uh, section, and a line if E equals to infinity. And the analysis are symmetric over both axes, major and minor, like a parabola and like a circle. And finally, a rare Baku theorem about uh, ellipses is that a ray of light shot from one focus that bounces off the ellipse will go to the other ellipse. And, you know, take that as you wish. But, yeah, it is a pretty cool theorem, but it's very rare from what I know. And, oh, yeah, finally, the equation of the ellipse. So, as before, this, let the semi-major axis be equal to A, and let the semi-minor axis be equal to B. The equation of an ellipse centered at h comma k is x minus h squared over a squared plus y minus k squared over b squared equals to one. And again, if you go back to the circle equation, which you know, I'll just go back here, right? x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals to r squared, where r is the radius. If you were to take a equals b, 
in the ellipse equation, then you get the circle equation. Which, you know, again, this ties back to the idea that circles and ellipses are tied together and that ellipses are stretch circles and circles are a subset of ellipses. All right. Finally, our last conic out of our four main conics is the hyperbola. A hyperbola is defined as a locus of all points P such that for fixed points A and B, the value of the absolute value of P times A minus P times B is constant. I mean, if you looked at the ellipse definition, then it was the value of P times A plus P times B is constant. But here for hyperbola, instead it is the absolute value of P times A minus P times B is constant. And again, we allow, you know, yeah, never mind. All right, so the a diagram of this hyperbola. So the, we say the graph is a bow, this sort of bow here, right? And we, we have the, we call the halves of this bow branches. That's what we call them. And again, here you see is a hyperbola with foci A and B. And similar to ellipses, yeah, again, we have the fo fo foci and B. And the vertices is C and D or D and C. And this is plural for vertex, by the way, of this hyperbola. They are the closest to the foci, as you see here. And the hyperbola takes its sharpest turn at the vertices. If you see here, you know, it goes in this direction and then at the vertex, it's immediately gonna go the, kind of the opposite direction, take a sharp turn all the way here. Sorry for the poor outline, but yeah. Oh, sorry. And yeah, notice that the distance between the vertices is the constant distance. All right, now we have asymptotes. Now, not labeled in the diagram, hyperbolas have, also have two asymptotes. Uh, and we say, we call the asymptotes of the graph of an equation, the lines that the graphs will never cross, although get arbitrarily close to. And just to reward that a bit, if the wording's not clear, it's like if a function approaches a certain point or a certain line, but it's not it's not going to be exactly on that line or point at some time, then we say that line is an asymptote. And now the properties of hyperbolas. Uh, we've already discussed the graph of a hyperbola. However, there's one more thing to add. The graph has two axes of symmetry. Now again, symmetric uh, symmetry is pretty common in comics. In fact, as you see, all of our conics are symmetric in some way. And one is the line AB. Yeah, and they have two axes of symmetry. One is the line AB, and the other is the line L passing through the midpoint of AB, such that the line L is perpendicular to the line AB. And there's not much else to say here. I mean, hyperbolas are pretty rare in contests anyways. But, yeah. So... And finally, we have the equation of a hyperbola. Uh, the equation of a hyperbola that opens left and right, as in the diagram, is x minus h squared over a squared minus y minus k squared over b squared equals to 1. And here, again, as you've seen, a, b, h, k, they take the same definitions as the previous equations. Uh, sorry, the previous equation in the left section. So again, if we go back to that, yeah, so the centered at h comma k, and we say here that the semi-major axis is equal to a, and let the semi-major axis be equal to b. All right, so now we're going to go on to our conversation problem. And for these, we're doing Hoover pretty early, which it's only 4.30 p.m. EST, or uh, 3 30 p.m central in my time so i'm actually going to give you guys a bit of time to work through each of these problems 
on your own before I present the solution. And there's also going to be a few exercises at the end of all of this for you guys to work through as well. So, uh, yeah, let's say I give you five minutes to try to construct an idea or try to give a go at this problem. And I'll give that much time for each problem. And I think it will be good then. So, yeah, go ahead, try this problem. It's the 2021 AMT 12A problem 20. And again, uh, the thing with all these problems is that they're sourced, so you can look them up. But if I were you, I would suggest that you, I strongly suggest that you try them first and do not immediately go to the solution uh, that is found online. Uh, and if you need a hint or if you're stuck, then DM one of the TAs or DM uh, me and you can get that from there. And also I will, if you guys have anything to share after this five minute period, then go ahead.
Okay, I'll start going over this with you now. So, does anyone have anything to share from working through this problem? And uh, I'll take that as a no, so I don't see anything in the chat. So, here is a solution. So, let the directives of the hyperbola be a line L. Of the hyperbola, right? So, and we're motivated to do so because of the properties it can give. So now observe there are two configurations. And uh, we can actually check this because uh, the problem statement asks for the sum of all possible values of f b. And while I don't have the diagrams here, I will search them up real quick so that you have a good idea of what those two configurations are off. Yep, right here. So this is a thread. Uh, yeah, I won't show the rest of the system, but yeah, these are good, two good diagrams of the two configurations I'm talking about. So I'm gonna get a glimpse of those and take screenshots if necessary, but because this is the two configurations I'll be referring to. All right, and so now we're gonna move back to the slide. So now we need to find f v, which equals to x. So now note that we ha also have v p equals to x. And by the definition of a parabola, a q equals to a f, h equals to 20. So now, given this information here, this just boils down to a geometry problem. So now we notice that f of fx equals to vy, which equals to, we're going to say this variable y. So now by the Pythagorean theorem, which I'm assuming you all know, we have two equations here. There's 20, minus x squared, I'm sorry, 20 minus x with all that brackets squared plus y squared equals to 21 squared. And the second equation is that 20 minus two times x squared plus y squared equals to 20 squared. And now we can solve for x by putting both equations in terms of y squared, and substituting. And by doing so, we get the equation 3x squared minus 40 times x plus 41 equals to 0. And by Vietas, which we covered in the last class, the answer to this problem is just 40 over 3. And alternatively, you can consider the equation of the problem, and that'd be another method of solving this problem. So you can find more solutions on that thread that I showed you. And, uh, and again, that has a really good diagram of those two configurations I'm talking about earlier. So that is the solution to this problem. So our next problem is from the recent mathematical advancement tournament, which you guys might have taken part in. And this is the 20 problem A from that MAT or MIT, MAT. 
So this is the problem. An ellipse with the focus of at uh, the point six comma two is tangent to the positive x axis at a comma zero. There is a maximum value of b such that for all zero is less than a, which is less than b, it is possible for this ellipse to be tangent to the y axis. If this maximum value of b can be expressed as m over n for relatively prime and positive integers, m and n, find m plus n. So that's the problem statement. And uh, you guys, again, you, you should go ahead and try this problem. And in five minutes, we will reconvene uh, to share the solution. All right, so we'll go for the solution now. Oh, well, we might not have given enough time, but yeah. So, and this is actually a pretty good example of synthetic geometry and ellipses. Uh, yeah, I, I found a lot of people like this, but I mean, there's also a lot of people who hate this and hate conics in general. But yeah, some conic problems are really nice. So for this problem, let f of one, we're gonna say let f of one be the point six comma two. And let the focus of the other list be two. So I'll show I write this in text. Focus Yeah, there we go. And I'll change up the color here a bit. So finally, we let the point A be the point A comma zero. So A equals to A comma zero. So given this, we were motivated to relate A with f of two and f of one. And a good trick that is useful due to the refractive property of ellipses is 
to reflect f of one over the x-axis and the y-axis to points p and q respectively. So just to again say that we're going a good trick that is useful due to the reflective property of ellipses is to reflect one over the x axis and y axis to points p and q respectively. All right, so now because f of one and f of one times x, so because f of one times x plus f of two times x is constant, oh, I just write as const with the p, which I previously said, uh, for any point x on the ellipse. So for any x on the ellipse. Sorry for my bad handwriting. I don't have my mouse with me. Maybe. So I'm using the keypad. All right. So, and due to the due to the vector property for ellipses, we can deduce that it is equal to f of one f of two prime. So we can deduce that it is equal to f of one f of two prime where f of two prime is the reflection of the second focus over the x-axis. So now we can compute this as the square root of six minus x squared plus two plus y squared, where x, comma y are the coordinates of the other focus. And I'll write this in a different color. So where x and y are the coordinates of the other focus. Now, in order for this ellipse to also be tangent to the y-axis, we must also have that this right here is equal to the square root of six plus x squared plus two minus y squared. So if you see here, you know, we're switching signs. So six minus x becomes six plus x and two plus y becomes two minus y. And we need this to be satisfied in order for the ellipse to also be tangent to the y axis. So, so this just becomes, when squaring, this just becomes the equation. This right here, six minus x squared, uh, plus two plus y squared equals to this here. Six plus x squared plus two minus y squared. I don't want to rewrite that again. So this solves, so we can solve this to get y equals to three times x. So now to finish this problem, we have to notice that we can define x as the intersection of the point f of one, f of two prime and the x-axis. And yeah, this gives us x. So with this being said, the equation of f of one, f of two prime is given by three case plus two times x 
plus k minus six times y equals to 20 times k. And by letting y equals zero, if you say y equals to zero, then we obtain this right here equals to 20 times k, right? So, which implies that x equals to 20 times k over three times k plus two. And as k tends to infinity, this is going to reach 20 over three. So this answer becomes 23 because you know we wanted to find m plus n per the answer extraction. And that's how you would solve this problem. All right, so our next problem is going to be from the Math Prize for Girls competition. It is 2012 Math Prize for Girls, problem 16. Uh, this is the problem statement say that a complex number X is three presentable if there is a complex number W of the absolute value of three, which such that Z equals to W minus one over W. Let T be the set of all three presentable complex numbers. The set of T forms a closed cur curve in the complex plane. What is the area of inside T? So I'll go ahead. And this is actually a bit simpler than these previous two examples. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, take a few minutes to do that. All right, so now we have this solution. And this one is actually pretty simple compared to the previous two ones, which is kind of my bad because I should have probably should have started with this one. But okay, so essentially we let W, actually let's switch a different color, yeah, here. W equals to X plus Y times I. 
yeah, again, this is a complex number where x squared plus y squared equals to nine. Again, this comes from, I mean, this comes from the fact that the absolute value of this complex number is three. So then therefore we have that, and I'll actually put this in text because it might be a bit weird. You have z equal to x plus yi times i, right? And again, given its definition, minus that over nine. Which equals to eight x over nine plus ten y over nine. Oh, sorry for those costs. Those were my dad from the other room. Uh, so thus the closed curve is just an ellipse. The closed curve that set T forms. So which is a circle with a radius three, then stretched by a, a factor of eight over nine in the X direction. And again, this goes back to the characterization that um, uh, ellipses are stretched circles. So thus, this area for the is simply just three squared times pi times eight over nine times ten over nine. And this goes back to the area of the ellipse. And so we had that the area is just 80 over 9. That was actually pretty simple. Those are 80 pi. Forgot the pi here. 80 times pi over 9. And our fourth and final problem for this class is going to be 2017 AMC 10B, problem 24. Uh, the vertices of an equilateral triangle lie on the hyperbola x times y equals one. And a vertex of this hyperbola is the centroid of a triangle. What is the square of the area of the triangle? So I'll take a few minutes to try that.
All right, and I will go. All right, so. So the ver the vertexes of the hyperbola are negative one comma one. I'm sorry, negative one comma negative one and one comma one. So without loss of general generality or vlog, let the center of the equilateral triangle be here. So at negative one comma negative one. So this is the center of the triangle. And so since the graph of y times x or x times y equals one is symmetric about the line y equals x. So y equals one symmetric about the line uh, y equals x or x equals y. We know that one of the vertices of this equilateral triangle, it must be a one comma one. So this has to be a vertice. So thus the distance from the center of the to a vertice of the triangle. And so this distance here is two times the square root of two. So this means that the height of the triangle, the height of the triangle equals to three times the square root of two, implying that the side length is Oh, so this is S. The side length is two times the square root of six. So therefore the area of this equilateral triangle is going to be this squared times three over, no, sorry, this side length here squared times the square root of three over four. And this would get you six times the square root of three. And so, we're asked for the square of the area of the triangle. So this gives us the answer of 100 A. And that was the solution to our 2017 AMC 10B problem 24, which is the last problem. And so this class has been finished. I hope you enjoyed and we'll see you in our future lectures.